We are uh, jumping back into this series. We really started last year, uh, the study of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and chapter six is kind of where we are today. He really started it in chapter five. And we are calling this series, The Way. And so as we do that, let me kind of set the scene this morning for uh, Jesus' teaching, his sermon here. Um, pretty much, uh, Jesus has been doing this intense ministry. And he has been preaching, he has been healing, and he's been uh, casting out demons. And his fame is spreading throughout all of Syria. He is trending. He's getting a lot of likes. He's, he's amassing this large crowds of people uh, to come and watch Jesus. Just watch him. And so he, he, he has this crowd, they're all around him, and he does the unexpected. He withdraws from the crowds, and he goes over to the hillside to teach the committed. Now, Jesus wasn't anti-crowds. Let me say that first of all. After all, heaven is going to be an innumerable crowd, right? So why is he doing this? Why is this withdrawal thing? I think there's two reasons why he's doing this uh, separation here. Number one, the focus of Jesus's ministry, his plan A to build his kingdom, build his church, reach the world, change the world, was not by attracting large crowds with casual fans. It was through discipling the devoted Christ followers. That was his plan. So that's what he's doing here. He pulls them aside to teach them the way. I think the other reason he does this is because the crowds were infected with culture. They, they had a certain worldview and that he didn't want that uh, infection to spread to his committed. So he's separating the crowds from his committed. And if these disciples were going to claim the name of Jesus... If they were going to submit to his lordship and be a part of building, helping build the kingdom and uh, bringing in and changing the world, reaching the world, they were going to have to live significantly and drastically different than the culture. They couldn't fall into the same worldviews, think the same way that the culture thinks, uh, couldn't fall into the social and sexual norms of the day. And so he had to sit them aside but he had to show them the way, what that looked like to live different than the crowds and the culture. 2,000 years later, and Jesus' method of ministry is still Jesus' method of ministry. There is no new church. There's no way of doing church. Today, there's not a new method. We aren't going to change the world uh, reach the world, build the kingdom of God by amassing and packing pews in churches or, 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 or are you and I gaining a lot of social media influence and presence. That's not the way that we're going to usher in the kingdom of God. It's going to come by discipling the devoted. And that's what we've been talking a lot about at our church. Haven't we talking about that for a long time about this discipleship culture that we're trying to build here. D groups, discipleship group. We have a lot of people doing this. I've been discipling men for about three years now um, at our campus. Uh, a lot of other people are leading D groups and discipling because this is Jesus's plan A to build the church. Not by having these awesome programs and just getting a lot of people to show up at over-programmed events. Now, uh, another uh, reality of this is this. The other way that we're going to build the church and reach the world and change the world is by separating from the crowds. You see, in our southern part of the U.S., it's very Syria-like. There are crowds of people all around us, watchers of Jesus, not worshipers of Jesus. Watchers of church, not worshipers in and with the church. People who fly the flag of Jesus, but they don't follow. A lot of bumper stickers, very few believers. This is what the crowd looks like. 
And Jesus is teaching here. He's, he's inviting them, he's inviting us to go up to the mountain, to look differently than the world, to not culturally camouflage ourselves, to live distinct lives, to help reach the world, to change the world, but he's got to show us the way. And that is the scene of his sermon, which is the greatest sermon that we've ever heard before and ever will by the greatest preacher. So chapter six, what Jesus does is showing them the way, he starts to show them the way of worship. Three ways that you worship in the kingdom of God, that Jesus shows you how to worship. Those three things, last week was giving, Today we'll talk about praying. Next week we'll talk about fasting. Three ways that we worship in the kingdom of God. Today, as I said, we're going to talk about prayer. Talk about prayer. All right? I've got a a good working definition. I've tried to make this very simplistic for us. It may not be anything new that you're kind of like, oh, wow, RC, I never knew that was prayer before. Uh, You might know this. But let me just, do you have that up? Maybe not. Let me read it. All right, prayer is this. Prayer is the communication directed to God the Father, empowered by God the Spirit, made possible by grace through faith in God the Son. Just a very simple definition as we get started today about what prayer is. I read a story one time about a man who took his younger son to Waffle House the greatest restaurant on the planet, right? We know that. And so he takes his son into Waffle House. They jump up at the bar and and place this order, very special time with the son. And they order the food and bring it out, all the scattered, covered, and, and all those things. And so they're sitting there having some conversations. Waitress comes out pretty quickly and puts the food down right on their on the counter there and the father looks at the son and said hey son just for a moment let let us bow our heads and have a silent prayer so they they bowed their heads and uh, father bowed his head the son bowed his head and after maybe i don't know 30 seconds maybe a minute the father lifted his eyes up and began to sit there he's kind of waiting on his son his son just kept sitting there quietly head down eyes closed and after about three minutes His son lifts his head up and the father says, all right, well, glad you can join me here. What were you praying about so long? His son replied, how do I know it was a silent prayer? (laughs) Y'all are a little slow this morning. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll give you a little cut, a little grace here. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the boy misunderstood the point of prayer. Uh, and I say that because I think we often, too, uh, misunderstand the point and purpose of prayer as well. Uh, it's not natural for us to pray. Let's just acknowledge some, some things. It's not natural for us to, um, to depend on someone, to talk to someone that, being honest, it's really invisible to the naked eye. That's not natural. It's counterintuitive to us to do that. You know what's very natural for us? To depend upon our wisdom and work to get things done. That's the natural thing for us to do. I'll take care of this. Wisdom, my words, work. That's the natural thing to do. The very unnatural thing to do is to cry out to this invisible God by the naked eye and plead with him. And so I think, I think we fall into these places of prayerlessness. I, I, there's a whole camp of people that kind of go there. And, and listen, even good theology, even a good understanding of the sovereignty of God can make us allergic to praying. So therefore, many people fall into the camp of a less than vibrant prayer life or a, a prayerless life, period. That's, that's where one camp is at. Now, the other camp, You might say, well, I pray. I pray pretty regularly, but often it comes out in the form of religious routines at mealtimes and bedtimes. It can also sound like this long Santa-like list of selfish demands that we want from our creator. And as a result, our prayers are not prayers at all. So today... Uh, D.A. Carson said this. This is a good one. D.A. Carson said, 
If you want to embarrass the average Christian, ask them about their prayer life. Now, listen, I I think you would agree. I would agree. I think we would all say, if we're truly honest, mirror in front, that our prayer life, we would say that it's less than vibrant. I I think we would all say that at some level, our prayer life is lacking and we do not pray as often as it should. So you don't need me today to heap on even more guilt and shame upon you. I don't think that would do anything to begrudgingly tell you to go pray more. I don't think that's that's very motivating for you. So what I want to do today is we're going to talk through this passage. We're going to talk about prayer and then we're going to pray at the end of our time together. And we're going to listen to Jesus' sermon about prayer. um, And he's going to teach us three things about prayer. He's going to teach us to pray secretly, to pray simply, and to pray submitted. Maybe maybe that third one should have been submittedly. I don't know. Would that have rhymed better? I don't know if that's a word. Uh, Let's read this together. Matthew 6, 5 through 13. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Notice before Jesus tells us how to pray, he tells us how not to pray. Out of the gate, he begins to say, uh, when you pray, of course, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners that they may be seen by others. Here is this warning against making prayer a a production of sorts. The culture, the religious culture of the day um, had this toxin present. These Jews, these devout Jews would often pray uh, very repetitiously and rigidly throughout the course of the day, three times a day, both in public and also in the synagogues. So they would often uh, fall into this temptation of praying for performance instead of a pure heart, praying for the applause of men instead of the approval of God so that they may be seen by their many words. No longer the father was the focus, but the ears of the people was the heart of the Pharisee. And so here... It's almost as if the Pharisees that he's trying to separate them from, they they would have thought, these disciples would have thought, well, I must pray like the Pharisees do. They're the religious varsity. And Jesus saying, no, 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 don't don't do that. They're way off. These Pharisees, it's almost as if they were saying, look at me, look what I can do. This past week at VBS, I love VBS. I was here every day like many of you. Man, I love loved this week at VBS. So many times you're just around all these kids and they, and they run up to you, Mr. RC, Mr. RC, look at me. Look what I can do, <laughs> right? And your kids do that. And it's just, they just do something. It's really not that special, but you know, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do when the kid says that? Do you start giving them a sermon about selfishness? No, I didn't do that. You say, oh, that's precious. When your kid does that, don't you say that? Yeah. Well, when an adult does it, it's not cool. <laughs> Look at me. Look what I can do. No one likes that guy or girl, right? No one wants to be that guy's friend. And so this is what Jesus is warning against, this idea of look at me, look what I can do, praying for the applause of men instead of the approval of God. He's reje- rejecting this severely. 
It's a good reminder for us today, again, that even if we have this beautifully formed language, we pray with the, uh, well, all of the anctions, the justifications, the sanctifications, and the, the election, and all, we could throw all those words out there all day long to tickle the ears of people so that we get the applause of others, but it will not gain the favor of God, and it means nothing. So how do we pray as people who belong to the kingdom of God? Here he goes in these three ways that teaches us to pray. The first thing he says is verse six, look at it, pray secretly. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now notice right here, Jesus doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. When you pray. He expects that Jesus' people will be praying people. And if you are Jesus' people and you don't pray, you're not Jesus' people. It's the assumption that if you say that you love God, that you worship God, that you serve God, that you would commune with God, not only through his word, but through his ear in prayer. So it's this assumption that we're going to do this. And in contrast to the Jews who wanted to be seen and heard by others, now Jesus says, pray in secret. Go into your room so you might be able to avoid the temptation to pray in front of other people. Shut your door. Spend time with the Father privately here. Now, he's not clearly condoning public prayer, Right? We, we pray publicly every single week we come into the gathering. Public prayer is a great thing, but so is secret prayer. I think the point here is what Jesus, of course, he modeled this with his life as well, secret prayer. But I think the point of secret prayer is, is twofold. I think it's number one is to keep something out, and then the, the other part is to keep something in. What does it mean to keep something out here? Well, again, praying in secret keeps out that temptation to please other people with our prayers. Like we do that in in staff meetings or in the congregation. There is always a temptation. It doesn't matter who's praying. There's always a temptation to pray in such a way to please other people. This stage is slippery. And so you have to be very careful. And so to avoid that temptation, just Go in secret, keep out that temptation, keep it away. I think the other reason that we pray to keep things out, we keep out distractions. We go out in secret to keep out the noise of the world. This is a model of Christ, right? How many times did he get up early in the morning to get away from the noise of the world, to get away from the chattering of the disciples and all their questions and all their complaints? What did he do? He went away in secret to get away from the noise of the world. This is a very good practice, by the way. In our home life, our prayer rooms, whatever the case it is, wherever you go, man, shut things out. Leave the phone out of the room. Our phones are no respecters of our quiet times. Can we agree with that? Leave them. If Jesus had to get away from even his own disciples who he loved dearly, he's like, I need a break, boys. Because he needed to keep out the noise of the world so that he could listen and focus in on the voice of his father. So it keeps something out. And of course, as he's keeping something out, it is about keeping God in. It's about protecting that space where we specifically hear his voice to us through, maybe it's our quiet time through the word, that we would be able to just focus on the Father with great intimacy. I think the practice of this, again, is a very uh, important thing for us to, to learn, that we, these, these things have to be planned. I, I think if you just wake up in the course of the day and you try to think, well, of course of the day, I'll probably be able to pray secretly, you probably won't. It has to be a planned thing. Not that you're losing the heart of prayer, but there has got to be some plan. I think, I know Jesus woke up specifically to get away from them. He had planned it probably the night before. 
He didn't roll over and say, what do I want to do today? No, he knew probably the night before he was going to wake up to get away and go secretly play or pray with the Father. I think we have got to be diligent in our scheduling and looking for and fighting for that time to pray secretly, to keep things out, and to keep God in. Now, there's something else I wanted to bring your attention to here. I thought it was really amazing. When Jesus says here, go into your room and shut the door. Now, he's not necessarily just meaning a closet at your house, although that's a good thing to do, right? The Greek word for uh, room here is he's talking about the storehouse where the plunder of, and the treasures were stored from times of war. So he's saying, hey, that room is a room full of treasure. When you get alone with God, there is more reward to be found in the secret place of prayer than the public place of praise. That approval that you seek in other people is merely a shadow of the approval of God that awaits those who love Christ Jesus. Church, we pray in secret. Second point is this, that we also pray simply. Simply. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Now, notice in the first section, he's warning them against praying like the Jews. The hypocrites, the religious varsity, all of the self-righteousness of those. Well, here he's a contrast, and he says, don't pray like the Gentiles. So he's, he's talking to a different group of people. Don't pray like them because they were part of the crowds in the culture too, right? How did the Gentiles pray? Well, they were polytheistic pagans. So they had a lot of gods that they worshiped. And what they would do in their prayer life is they would just keep praying and throwing out all of the different names of all the gods and all of their persistent begging and just the hopes that they would get the favor of those gods in some way by their persistent nagging. Ever have your kids pin you and your spouse against each other with their persistent nagging to get their wills? (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? One goes to one and they're just back and forth because they're trying to break the will of a parent so they cave with their persistent nagging over and over and over again. That's a little bit of the idea here. And he says, don't do this. Don't, Don't just throw out anything in order to get your will accomplished. Don't keep up these empty phrases, he says, like the pagan world. Speaking against babbling and droning and just repetition over and over and over again. We know that, that our odds for our prayer life don't increase because we say Father, Son, Holy Spirit in them or 18 Father Gods like, we get no additional favor. Man, I used to have a friend, and he would do that. Like, he talks a certain way. He's like, oh, bro, what's up, man? Well, oh, prayer time. Oh, he, he got to put on the different persona. And there's 18 father gods, and his voice started to influx, and he started to talk. I'm like, who are you, man? He's trying to perform. He's trying to heap up empty phrases to get the praise of other people, and he's warning us against those things. There's power in the simplicity of our words, church. You don't have to be a theologian or a professor of theology at a seminary school in order to lift up a God-honoring prayer. It's just simple. Just mean what you pray. Unknown Arthur says this, the simple prayer of the people of God before the eyes of God carries the power of God. Very true. Last piece here. You guys are, I'm cooking through this. Y'all are so proud of me, I know. Last piece here. Uh, To pray submitted, but don't celebrate too early. We still have a long point here. Um, Here we go. Uh, Pray submitted. And this is in 9 through 13, of course, and this is the one that we're most 
familiar with here. And it says this, pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, here Jesus changes uh, the, the, the sermon from motivation of prayer to model of prayer. Motivation to model. He doesn't say, hey, your prayer life, just, I mean, whatever comes out of your heart. I mean, just get alone with the spirit and just lift up whatever you're feeling in that moment. I mean, you and God are cool. Just, he didn't, just whatever you want to do, just lift it up, right? That's not what he says here. He gives a very specific model for our prayer life, not a a rigid formula of you can only pray this, but a a prayer like this. This should be the bones, the structure, the, the tracks of our prayer life that we stay on so that we would have a healthy prayer life. And this is, of course, known as the Lord's Prayer. Martin Luther called the Lord's Prayer the greatest martyr on earth. Why? Because it's mindlessly murdered over and over and over and over again without faith, without reverence, without understanding, and without honor. I think there's a couple reasons why it is murdered. Some mindlessly murder it every single week by robotically reciting it in churches. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. And the people sound like droids. No heart. Over and over and over again. Side note, the prayer is not the problem. It's the person. But it's murdered all the time. All across all the different denominations and churches, it's mindlessly murdered all the time. Another way that I think it's murdered is uh, if you've ever played sports before in your life. You guys are already kind of knowing where I'm going with this one. Um, you, you might have recited this prayer before you ran through the paper on the football uh, field or right, but the team huddle right before you went out to whatever. And so people are just like, Lipping that thing and reciting it in the hope that, that's, that we would become these religious um, athletes, these superstitious athletes, and hope that favor would come our way. I did that uh, so many times when I was a college basketball player. I murdered the Lord's Prayer so many times. It's this uh, reciting it over and over again. I didn't know Jesus, and they didn't really care as long as I said the right words. Hey, maybe if I say this, I'll, uh, maybe we'll win. Maybe I'll dunk on somebody in this game if I just pray the Lord's Prayer, right? It, it's just, it's this superstitious athlete thing. And I'm just over and over again. And you know what I'm talking about because we've all done this to some degree. I think Jesus knew we would struggle with our prayer life in all of these ways. So he gives us this this order, this structure to keep us on track. Now, here's what I want to do about this section. I'm not going to go through all of the Lord's Prayer and all of the petitions here because honestly, it's a series. It's not a sermon. We could spend a long time on it. And and I would even say that you could even maybe go back on our website and search Lord's Prayer. We probably have some good material out there uh, to show you those things. But I want to talk about the order the model of this from a 50,000 foot view of what's happening in the hopes that we may order our prayer life that is consistent with the Lord's prayer. So here's the order. This prayer has the beginning invocation of father in heaven. So there's the beginning invocation. That's just the start of it. And then it's got six petitions, six petitions here. The first three Petitions focus on the preeminence of God. The last three petitions focus on the practical needs of us. 
in the context of the church. There's order in this prayer. You might have seen before um, the acrostic acts. I teach uh, my disciples sometimes that it, it's an it's, it's a acrostic that stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And it comes out of the Lord's Prayer. It's a good way to kind of stay on track in there. But this order is so very important, again, for our prayer life. Not for every single prayer that we pray, but for our prayer life. It is so in- important. Why? Because in a healthy prayer life, God always comes first. Before we lift up our give me my daily bread, God, deliver me from temptation, give me my needs, give me my healings, give me a job, give me money, give me a spouse, give me, give me, give me. Before we get to any supplications, we must first and pause and listen to the Lord's prayer that says we must call upon God. Everything starts with a proper understanding of who God is. And this order here, first it says, we pray that God's name will be hallowed, honored, and famed. That his name would be held in great reverence in my life and in this world. That his name would be hallowed. That his name would be made famous across the world. Now that is a a specific prayer That helps us because when we pray that kind of prayer in our prayer life, we are slaying our selfishness. When we're more concerned about the fame of God and his name being revered, then I don't get as upset when mine's not. When I don't get the amount of likes I wanted to get on my post, I'm not crushed. Because the name of God is what I am praying for. The second thing he says here, that we pray his kingdom comes. Number one, that faces me with, okay, God is a king. Jesus is a king and he has a kingdom. And I am for his kingdom, not my own kingdom of one, not my kingdom of comfort. That I'm about and I'm used as a vessel to advance the kingdom of of God. I'm more concerned about his kingdom than my own comfort in my life. This also helps us to have a vibrant missionary spirit. Like if you just blow past it, your kingdom come, you will be done. like you miss the whole thing, but you stop. Your kingdom come. Oh, well, how is your kingdom going to come? Oh, wow, it's through me. Through me preaching the gospel. For me sharing the gospel, I'm a missionary when I'm about the kingdom of God coming and not my own kingdom of one. The third thing he says is, your will be done. Your will be done, not my will, but your will. When it comes to the will of God, there are two forms of God's will. There is the secret will of God. And then there is the revealed will of God, which is everything in here. I think when we read the Lord's Prayer and we say, your will be done, we automatically go to the secret. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. We don't know what God's will is. If if I'm supposed to marry this person or go get this job here and move here, the secret will of God, we don't know. So we do pray, God, I don't see it clearly. Your will be done. And if you don't take away the cancer, Your will be done. If you don't give me this job, your will be done. All of those things, we trust in his will above all things in his secret will. So yes, we can pray that. But do you know what he's also talking about here when he says your will be done? Our prayer, when we say your will be done, we are saying that we pray that his revealed will in scripture is done in my life, that I obey the Bible That his word will be exalted and obeyed throughout all of the earth because he is Lord of all. So we pray, yes, for his secret will to be better than ours. But we pray that his revealed will in scripture would be obeyed in our lives and not our own will. And all of this, of course, listen, 
This grates, praying like this grates against our very being. Let's just acknowledge that's not easy. I don't know about you. When I wake up in the morning, you know what I want to pray for? I got big plans for my name today. I got big plans to try to build my kingdom of comfort. What do I want? What do I want? Maybe we'll get something from the house that's making my life a little bit better. What kind of car do I need? Or I need this. I need this. Like all day long, I can easily go to trying to build my own kingdom. I, I, I'm, I wake up wanting my will for my life. I want my day to go according to how I want my day to go. So this, this prayer grates against our very nature our old nature. And I think Jesus is teaching here that if we model our prayers like this, again, not every prayer that we pray, but if we model our prayers like this, we are perfectly and properly positioned to come to the king with our petitions for the daily bread for the deliverance from evil and temptation and all of those things that we need because we're needy people, right? So he is talking to us and he said three things again today. Recap. To follow the way of Jesus, one of the ways we worship is through prayer, praying in secret, praying simply, and praying submitted. Now, here's how we're gonna close out today. We're going to, in just a moment... We're going to pray secretly. We're going to pray secretly where we sit with the Lord's prayer on our minds, with that kind of framework. And listen, you want to pray out loud where you are? Pray out loud. Don't care about what everybody else is doing. Remember, you ain't praying for them anyway, right? So if you want to pray out loud, pray out loud. If you want to pray quietly there, that's okay too. But I'm going to give you a moment to actually pray through, being mindful of the Lord's prayer and the structure that is there. And if you want to use the acrostic acts to get there, that's fine too. But this is what I want us to practice here. But before we do that, there's something very, very important. Who gets to pray this prayer? This is not a universal prayer. Well, the only requirement is, is you just have, a, have to have a pulse or a heartbeat. This is a private prayer language only for those who are children of God. Notice the invocation again is our Father in heaven. Only people who can pray this are people that can say our Father. Who is he the father of? Who are the children of God? That's the next question. Well, we know that through a healthy reading of the book of Romans, no one's born into the family of God. Our sin has disqualified us from being in his family and being called children. We are, in fact, spiritual orphans. That's the state of our hearts Only people who believe and receive in the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection, having faith, grace through faith in Jesus, giving their life to Christ, loving Christ, following the way of Christ, only those people have the right to pray this prayer and call him Father. Look at John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Have you received and have you believed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ? It's not religion. We're not talking about religion. We're not even talking about Christianity at this point. We're not talking about church, structure, no classes you went to as a child. I'm not talking about did you get dunked or wet on the head when you were a baby. I'm not talking about any of those things. I'm talking have you believed and received the person 
and the work of Jesus Christ as your only means to be right with God and to call him Father. If you have not done that, here is a great invitation. I've just told you the way that you can actually become a child of God to call him Father. If, if you haven't done that, I want to talk to you. We want to talk with you about that. There's a, a public confession of that. You need to go tell somebody with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And so if you have not done that, would you stick around today afterwards? Come find us on the way out. You can take one of those blue cards and you can fill that out. And it's just a private say, hey, contact someone, whatever. We, we just want to help you understand who this person of Jesus is and the work that he has accomplished. And if you've not yet done that, I'm actually going to tell you, don't pray this prayer. Probably never heard of that before. Don't pray in church is what I'm telling you. Because if you do, you're mindlessly murdering it. You have no understanding of what a father means and any of the words in it. And it has no bearing and no power in your life. So I want you to pray it rightly And in order to pray it rightly, you must come to Christ to believe and receive him first. So to those have done that, who have confessed in the name of Christ to believe and receive, now we're going to do the Lord's Prayer together. I'm going to give you uh, just a few minutes to do that where you sit at your seat. And then I'm going to come up in just a moment and close us out with something else.
Father, hear the cries, the pleas, the words of your people here at Life Point Stewart's Creek today, at all Life Point campuses as we lift up prayers to you today. God, may the motivation of our heart be right. May the model of our prayer life be pleasing to you. Be exalted. Your name be renowned upon all of the world. Your will, both secret and revealed, be done in our lives. And God, just give us all of our needs because we are needy and you are worthy of us asking. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Notice when Matthew's account of the Lord's Prayer said, Pray like this, right? So we've said that this is not just a rigid formula that we can only recite for our prayer life. It's a model. However, Luke's account, when the disciples ask him to teach him, teach them how to pray, the account said, pray this. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that this prayer can be used as a model to for private prayer in our lives, but it also can be a prayer to recite publicly. Notice all the collective pronouns that are in this prayer, the us's, the we's. You understand how the church, this is a, this is a church prayer. This is not me and my own little thing in my own private world, me and Jesus. This is a we and Jesus prayer. So we want to pray this Right now, I'm going to ask you to stand up. We're going to read this prayer together. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. With humility and with heart, with comprehension and with conviction, let's read this prayer together. Lord, hear our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Love you guys. Let's worship.